Okay, uh, let's start. Um, yesterday we kind of started looking at uh, how to construct a measurement which measures uh, uncertainty or outcome in a league table. Okay, that's what we're aiming for now, to kind of end up with some kind of measurement for these, uh, these type of information. Um, we discussed briefly this concept of uncertainty outcome yesterday. Uh, there is a kind of parallel uh, thing which we often refer to as competitive balance, which kind of means the same thing. Okay, so when we, when we talk about competitive balance, then we have a league where there is a relatively high uncertainty outcome. Okay, then there is a, a balanced competition, competitive balance. The, the opposite is competitive imbalance. So competitive imbalance means low uncertainty outcome. Okay? So the, the, these two other terms are kind of pinpoints different types of uncertainty out outcome, if you like. So it's, it's good to kind of know these terms. Um, we discussed this uh, least competitive point score thing by this formula, which simply kind of arranges a table where the best team beats all other teams, the second best teams beat all other teams except the best team and so on. And then we discussed this um, maximal competitive situation where we, for simplistic reasons, assume that every match ends in a draw. Uh, let's look at an example here, not before we move on. Okay, here you see <coughs> uh, the final table for the Norwegian female handball season 2001-2002 and as we briefly discussed last time you see even then Lodewijk was very good which they still are, are, are I assume so they kind of won this series for the last 15 years or something I don't think they have ever lost one match actually you see this season they, they obtained 66 points okay so they won every match this is the actual table okay that is the AP action point score. So you see here that Ludwig was very good here. They won out of 22 played matches. Uh, they kind of got 66 points, which of course means that we assume a three point uh, victory system here. Three times 22 is 66. But you see the second team, Nordstrand, they should have kind of obtained 60 if this was a, a league without any competition, but they kind of only got 46. So you see it's kind of more narrow here among the two, three, and four best teams. They are kind of more equal. But at the bottom here we see so a number which kind of indicates again that there is kind of bad competition in this league because uh, this is the worst possible outcome in this sense. And you kind of just to compare this, this line with this line. So this column is generated by this formula. Okay? This one is, is simply number of matches times the point score for a draw and this is the actual point score. So this is the kind of information we use now to, to construct our measure. So let's have a look here. Let us look at the following construction. Epsilon I. Epsilon is a Greek letter, the same as E. We, we, we draw it like this. Okay, you have to get used to using Greek letters. When we do some mathematics, we need a lot of letters to to kind of uh, symbolize what we mean. And it's always a good thing to kind of use this other alphabet to, to denote certain stuff. So we look at this epsilon i and we square it and we define it like this. L P C I minus A P I and of course squared. So what is this? Now we take the worst possible outcome here these values, each of these values, and we subtract each of these values. Okay. And this subtraction means that we kind of measure the distance from the actual reality to a certain minimal competitive situation. Okay. So if this difference is very small, like in the first number here, it means that we have a very 
We have a league where competition is very small. Okay. We see that on the top here and at the bottom, this difference is very small. And the reason why we square it, put these two up here, is of course to take care of the fact that it could be that this number is smaller than that number, so we get a negative number. And what we want to do in the end is to add all these distances together to find a kind of total distance for the league as a whole. And to avoid that these possible pluses and minuses cancel each other, we have to do some kind of operation to avoid that. And the normal way of doing this in statistics is to square it. So that's the reason for the squaring. Okay? Then, at the next step, we can add these together. Okay? We can compute this epsilon 1 square, this epsilon 2 square, this epsilon 3 square. And let's just do it in the table to see how it works. The first one is then 66 minus 66 squared, which of course equals 0. The second one would then be 60 minus 46 squared. 60 minus 46, that is 14, isn't it? So this is 14 squared, which I don't have <coughs> in my head. Of course, you need a calculator to do this, okay? And the third one would then be 54 minus 46 squared. 54 minus 46, that's 8, isn't it? Yeah. So it's 8 squared, which would be 64 in this case. This one I don't have in my head. Okay, so this is kind of how we do this. Okay, so we continue through the whole table here, and then at the bottom we add everything together. So we keep on doing this. This don't do this epsilon. Uh, how many teams do we have here? 12, don't we? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yes. And the number 12 would be how much? 0 minus 3 squared, which is 3 squared, which is 9. So then we just add everything together, and this number tells us something, how this league deviates from this specialized situation. Okay? Kind of tells us how close or how far are we from this situation where there is no competition whatsoever in the league. That is in many ways enough for us, okay? Because if this number is big, then we know something. If it's small, we also know something. Yes? Uh, on the top one there, for first place, shouldn't it, shouldn't it be 66 minus 66? Oh yes, of course, Christian. Very good. That was what you meant, wasn't it? It should be 66 instead of 60. Sorry, a typographic error on my hand. So immediately when you see this, tell me, okay? So at the bottom here, we have kind of done this. We have added together all these numbers. The mathemat mathemat one mathematical way of describing that is through this sum, okay? And we've also done one more thing. We have divided by the number of matches here to get to get some kind of measure uh, per match. This is not necessary. Okay. We will see later on why. Okay. Now let's construct another measure here. Uh, and this sum here, we name it, let's say we can call it another Greek letter, a sigma, written like this. Is we can define it as the sum over some i here, all possible i's, this l c p i minus a p i squared. So this sum is just adding together all these numbers, okay? These numbers we find here. And in the textbook you see I also add this 1 over n here, which I already have said is really not necessary, okay? Now let's look at something else. Let's define this sigma max squared. These are two different numbers now. And again, we look at the sum. But now we put something different in here. We put LCPI minus MCP. Was it MCP I call it? Yes. So what are we doing now? Now we are constructing, sorry, 
the maximal possible distance between a very competitive league, everybody, every team is equally good, and a non-competitive league. So this kind of de de defines the total variation in the league. And the idea then is that if we look at this ratio here, we are able to norm our number, meaning that it's either a value close to zero or something close to one, something in between zero and one. And if we then multiply this by 100, then we get a percentage measure for league competitiveness. And it means here, and if we put a name on this fraction, I think I've called, used another Greek letter, letter a row, L, total kind of league competitiveness. We should understand now that is if, if we have a very a league <coughs> with limited competition, then these numbers would be relatively close to these numbers. Do you agree? And then when we subtract them, we get small numbers, we square them, they are still small, we add them together, we get a kind of small number. So a small value on this one, meaning a value close to zero, would mean a highly uncompetitive league. The opposite, if there is a big distance here, big difference between these numbers and these numbers, of course, we, we, we square it, get even bigger numbers, add it, get a very big number course not as big as this number which is the maximally possible variation so to speak but this big number then end up ends up being a percentage closer to a hundred percent and that is a situation where we have high competition in the league so the idea then is just to calculate this number and look at it then you can compare handball American football baseball whatever and look at these numbers and you see this league is out of competition, this league has a good competition, that kind of stuff. So this is a measurement which makes it relatively easy to, to check whether a league has a high or a low uncertainty of outcome. That is the point. Okay. Now if we move on here, there is a couple of examples here. Here we have kind of finished all the calculations. For the example we started to look at, this female Norwegian handball season, 2001-2002 season. And the first three columns, we already know. Uh, <coughs> you see here that 14 squared is 196. So these numbers we did calculate, didn't we? 0, 196, and 64. The last one we did calculate turns out to be 9. Of course, we had to fill in all the rest in the same manner. Then we just add all these numbers together, so that together that produces 20.27. And then we construct this one, which is this one, of course. That should be relatively straightforward. Then instead of taking this one minus this one and square, we take this one minus this one, this one minus this one, and so on, and square. 66 minus 22 is uh, 44, isn't it? 44 squared should then be 1936. 60 minus 22 would be 38, wouldn't it? 38 squared should be 1444, and so on. First, then we add all these numbers together, so they, they turn out to be 300. And then we can construct this sigma L, or sorry, this rho L, by just taking that one, divided by that one, and multiply by 100. So for this example, this rho L, example is the sigma L square which was 20.27 divided by sigma max square which is 300 multiplied by 100 and that produces this value down here 6.76 percent this is a relatively small number isn't it it indicates that Norwegian female handball is something where you know what will happen, more or less, okay? More or less. 
not completely, of course, we kind of observed here that we had some teams here which are kind of equal. But then if you move down, okay, there is a couple here. But apart from these two teams and these three teams, these other teams kind of distribute relatively close to this ideal or non-ideal situation. So let's compare these to football. Okay. So what would we expect will happen now? if you do the same on a football league. Any suggestions? What will happen to this number? Will it increase or decrease? Increase? That was you, Simon? Very good. It should increase. Our hypothesis is that female handball is less competitive due to all these silly rules, OK? No passive play only three steps and so on, okay? All this stuff makes uh, the sport much more predictable. Of course, less interesting for the audience. This is kind of our explanation why football is popular or more popular than other team sports. Okay, so what uh, kind of football league should we pick then, do you think? What kind of football league has historically been assumed to be the, l the less competitive league? I want to compare this not to those football leagues where everything can happen, but to a football league there we at least know that certain teams are very good and other teams are not that good. If you were to pick a league, which league would you think about? Of course, Tip League is not nice, okay? It's uh, kind of everybody beats everybody. Apart from mm -hmm. this season, but normally, okay. What countries do you think we should? Spain, maybe? Germany, Bayern Munich is always very good. Uh, Borussia Dortmund is always number two. Yeah, that seems nice. Spain is, an, is a possibility, isn't it? We have Barcelona and Real Madrid. They're always better than all the other teams. But all the other teams are kind of equally good, aren't they? Yeah, so we shouldn't uh, accept these kind of effects. But I've chosen a different league. I've chosen the Scottish League. In the old days, of course, the Scottish League was peculiar, okay? Because Celtic and Rangers was always beating all the other teams. This has changed, hasn't it? You know the reason for that? Uh, something bad happened to Glasgow Rangers. What was that? They are not, they're not in the top league anymore, are they? They kind of put down due to some financial problems, I think. They kind of and started up at the bottom of the system again. So they are still way down in the, in the league system in Scotland. Of course, Celtic is still good, although after getting a Norwegian coach, it seems that they're not as good as they used to, okay? So, <laughs> so there is, but of course the data here is from a different period of time than, than now, okay? So here is an example of the 1999-2000 season in the Scottish League, where Rangers won by achieving 90 points out of 108 possible, okay? That, mean, that means that they lost only 18 points. Over actually a fair amount of matches, 36. How many points do you think Molde will lose this year? They have lost two, that's nine points. They have draw five, that's ten points. So they have al already lost more points in this season than Ranger did in that season, and they play more matches here. Okay, so you, you get the feeling how superior Rangers was in this season. Okay. They played even stronger compared to the others than Molde have done this season. Much stronger actually. And of course, you do the same now. You just have to, to make the numbers right. These numbers are straightforwardly calculated. There's 36 matches, 36 times 3. That is 3 times 6 is 18, isn't it? 3 times 6 is 9, 90 plus 18, 108, OK. And then there is, you have to subtract some matches here to, to get this next number. And uh, this probably a kind of uh, four times series here. It seems, okay, they are playing not two times against each other, but four times. Because there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten teams, meaning each round would be nine matches. Nine times four is 36, okay? So this is a kind of quadruple league at that point. They didn't only play two times against each, against each other, but four times. Of course, we have to adjust for that when we construct this LCP. And then the actual point score here, and you see... <coughs> The superiority of Rangers is kind of okay, even Celtic. But if you kind of compare these numbers, you see that almost all teams here 
are almost equally good. Okay, the difference between this team and this team is less than 20 points. If you look at the Norwegian league today, what is the difference between Sonnesulf and Molde? Do you know that? Are you operative on these numbers? Molde has 68 points today, haven't they? And Sonnesulf, they have 21. So you see there's, uh, maybe we can take another team than Molde and we're kind of comparing to number three here. So number three today is Rosenborg, they have 54 or something. So you see the difference here is still much bigger than, than maybe this difference. So the point here, if you look at the tables, it's not straightforward to see this, but if you kind of calculate this, then you kind of get, that, get the indication of to where to look. And of course, you, you do this the same in the same van, way as you did in the first table. You just take these differences, you square these differences, square, add together and make this fraction. So this 31.02% comes up by taking 130.28 divided by 420 and multiply by 100. And the point, the reason why we did this was to give an indication of the difference between female handball in Norway and football in general, based on the fact that this is suspectedly, at least at this point in time, the least competitive football league. And you see you get 31.02% here, which is much bigger than this number here. So we can kind of establish through this relatively simple analysis that football has a very much higher <coughs> uncertainty outcome than female handball. Of course, we did kind of suspect or maybe even know that before we did this, but these numbers kind of get opens up for a possibility for a more clear comparison between different sports. We can use them to compare leagues for a certain point in time. But we can also use them to look at what's happening over time. So we can take Tipe Ligan for a set of years and compute these numbers and kind of make a graph and see has competitiveness increased, has it decreased, and so on. We can use it to check whether certain changes has had effect. So we can compute it before a certain change and after a certain change and see how that change may have affected competitiveness. For instance, there was an important change at a certain point in time when you move from a 2-1-0 point system into a 3-1-0 point system. That may have had some effect. We will look at into this later on, on competitiveness. For instance, all kind of rule changes in football might affect serious changes here. And if changes become serious, then it's difficult, dangerous, okay, because it may kind of, kind of kill the popularity of the sport. So if you make changes which kind of favors the good teams too much, then you will kind of lose this concept of competitiveness. Uh, of course, if you, you kind of need to understand this and be able to kind of do it, okay? That it may be a question on the exam, okay? To you may get some numbers here, explain them or calculate them or whatever, okay? So this is something you, you need to do. Uh, it's straightforward to do this in Excel if you really want to do it. It doesn't take much time. You just need to to, to pick a certain league table or a set of league tables, and uh, then you construct this LCP and MCP based on, on 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 the structure, and then you just calculate these two rows, add together, and produce this final measurement row L, or the the total league competitiveness, so to speak. Okay, of course this is not game theory. Okay, this is statistics. Okay, but again we kind of use it to emphasize some other points later on here. Uh, if you're not very happy with all these calculations, there is kind of a simpler graphical way of doing this. Okay, so let's have a look at that. Now here, I don't. I plotted two curves. I plotted. LCPI as a function of itself. This is this straight line, okay, this red line. So what I do now is I kind of start out with a 45 degree. It should actually look like this. This is kind of not good because it's 60 and 120 here, so it should be 
much more in that direction and then it would be 45 degrees okay so it's kind of the scale which kind of fools us here so this is kind of how these figures should look look like if it was it, if it was was evenly scaled and then so we have lcpi along one axis and lcpi along the other axis of course if you plot one value against this other if there's 10 here and you get 10 here of course you always get the 45 degree so then we also plot this api in the same diagram and then given that api kind of fits this line then there is no competition so if you look at female handball you get something which kind of looks like this it seems okay now if you change from the norwegian uh, women's handball situation move over to the scottish then of course you get a different image here and what's happening now is that this image changes of course uh, you see here what happens you kind of get much bigger deviations it kind of becomes like this and this tells us that it's kind of the, the total difference between these two curves which is kind of what we're computing here so you can just look at the graphs here and you see here this situation has good competition okay? there's a big distance between the blue line and the red line the previous situation has bad competition because the blue line is kind of cramping up to the red line like uh, here okay it's kind of very close it's kind of almost there so this is a kind of a simple easy visual way of identifying what's happening of course again you have to make these plots then to, to kind of see it so yeah okay any questions Maybe we should point uh, at some final comments here. We have argued the ball on behalf of soccer or football. This is kind of a textbook meant for the American market. More or less as the ultimate game. Of course, this is not true. The ultimate game has not yet been constructed. Okay, there is always potential to make a better game. And by better game here, I mean a game which draws more attention and hence becomes more interesting from a finan financial point of view. That's that's the what I mean by better, okay? The more people that wants to pay to watch produces a better game. Okay, so this is kind of done in a financial perspective. The main point of the above arguments was to compare soccer to other known team sports and establish a set of logical arguments. These arguments may be summed up as follows. Football is easy to learn and cheap to play. Okay, we discussed that. That's that's one obvious advantage compared to other sports you don't have to invest a lot in making everything very nice in able to perform the sport there's no special needs skills needed to contribute on the other hand of course if you have special skills then you then you're good but you can still perform good at least it, at the blink of a moment even without actually knowing anything so to speak the final part which, which we kind of have stressed here is the, the enormous strategic complexity okay the complexity of the game there is some arguments in the textbook here on trying to kind of compute this complexity but uh, sorry i just have to see if this is hello Ringer ikke bra i Hønefoss. Kanskje du ringer meg tilbake om nøyaktig et kvarter, du? Jeg sitter akkurat i forelesning. Ok, hei. Ja. Er det noen som er fra Hønefoss her? Nei. Journalister. Det blir plaget. Ok. Hence, the beauty of soccer, or the beauty of football, may be characterized as a unique blend of ease and complexity one hand it's easy cheap on the other hand it's complex because there is so many possible situations you can kind of construct in football as noted about this unique blend is by no means secure forever some soccer history may prove inst instructive so vividly described by Egil Olsen you know who Egil Olsen is previous Norwegian 
national team coach, maybe not known in Belgium, but uh, kind of a well-known character here. Uh, soccer has changed, or football has changed a lot. Okay, you, you should read his, if you're interested, you should read his master thesis. And he described all these very early football systems. There is one called the 1-1-8 system, which contained one defender, one midfielder, and eight attackers. That's kind of how it started. Everybody kind of ran into attack. But of course, it kind of changed. And then, uh, this, the system of actually passing the ball actually didn't come before in the, in the 1850s. Of course, today, football without passing seems kind of crazy, but in those days, it was there were several years there where they didn't actually pass the ball, they just shoot it up and try to get it in the goal. Eighteen seventies, as here, invented by the Scots. Not changes yet. So this is, uh, <coughs> the point is, of course, that every sport, sport have to change, okay? Because when the players or the sports people or the athlete becomes better, then it kind of may obstruct the mix of ease, complexity, and uncertainty outcome. Yeah? So to kind of keep the audience, then we have to change it. Okay. Let's just like uh, a more obvious situation, if you're kind of able, for, for instance, through game theory, to find the recipe for chess, because chess should have a recipe. I don't know, we maybe we briefly discussed this early in the course. Then, of course, there's no point in playing chess as it is, and then you have to change the rules to still make it interesting. Of course, the same thing happens in sports. If uh, a certain set of football players develop skills, it, make it makes it possible for them to, let's say, 99 out of 100 times to, to make a goal directly on the corner kick, then of course you have to do something. Okay, because that will kind of obstruct football, as we say today. Well, what will happen then, do you think? The defending teams will try to avoid corner kicks, won't they? That will be everything what it will, will be about, okay? And you can think about what kind of strategies they will offer. They will be very careful with, they will try to get the ball very early, not leaving the opponent to get on their half. And uh, they will be extremely interested in not being exposed to corner kicks. So then, of course, you will have to change the rules, perhaps. Maybe not have corner kicks, maybe throw ins on the corner side as a simple solution. And that will kind of keep more the normal system. So the point is here that uh, it's not given that any sport would be as popular as football is in the future. It depends on how those who kind of regulate and make decisions in football make these decisions. They must be made in the right way to avoid both changes in the game and also to have to be aware of possible competitors. If there are certain other games that kind of grow up that becomes very popular then you have to look at what's happening here. What can we do to make our sport still the most popular. So this is kind of important points. Yeah, the textbook contains some exercises. I think uh, before we now take the break, I will just show you them. Have a little look at, um, at the frontier and the exercise for next week. Okay, it's, it's a good idea that you spend some time looking at it. Um, mm. Of course, these exercises are kind of not related to this part of the curriculum, but th the previous part on this first textbook, so it's kind of a general game theory. So let's just look at it. So this is in Norwegian, then, uh, Janka, do you understand that in Norwegian? So it means I have to translate it in this into English? <laughs> <laughs> I can do it live, maybe you can remember it. Okay. Uh, two players who are playing a simultaneous game can choose among two possible strategies from the same strategy space, call them S1 and S2. So here we kind of define uh, just two strategies, which are named. And if, uh, so we are kind of setting up a situation in the first exercise here, where we, we say there are two players, each of them have two strategies. So there's S1, S2, S1, S2 here. And uh, the first point of the exercise is to construct this matrix here, or this table. And the information is given here. If both players 
choose this, the same strategy, then they get the same payoff of A. Okay, so if they choose this one, both gets A. Or if they choose these two, both gets A. If they choose different strategies, then they get payoff B. Okay, so the idea on exercise A here is just to, to, to put in the A's and B's on the right places here. Okay. And then we make an assumption about B and A, and we assume that B is bigger than A, and then I want you to find all Nash equilibria of the game. And then I assume that B is less than A, and find all Nash equilibria of the game. Compare and comment. Now these are types of games, as we briefly discussed yesterday, which we refer to as chicken and stag hunt games. So these have more than one Nash equilibrium. And one of these equilibria it would be a mixed strategy. You haven't kind of learned to do that, so you, you don't need to bother with that. Okay, Just identify these. And then finally, what happens if A equals B? You can look at this, okay? It's kind of a theoretical work here, just to give some. And then we kind of, in the second one, we kind of spin on, on this uh, example in the textbook of these papers, these headlines, or the, the front page stories of these papers. There are two newspapers here, paper one and two. They're competing on this first page option. If you look in the first textbook, Yenka, there is an example here which kind of this exercise builds on. Okay. And then we assume something here, and uh, again, uh, there is a question on what paper is the biggest one. That should be straightforward. And then there is this two different cases, one which is very important, one other one which is not. And, uh, and then uh, we make a formulation here. And you're the point for you then is to kind of look into it and see if it seems sensible related to the information given in the exercise. Discuss whether you think this game matrix or game table gives a, a sensible interpretation of the inf information above. Of course, this information Yenka says that assume now that a case or a front page possibility A is completely uh, revolutionary. For instance, the outbreak of the Third World War or naked pictures of the Prime Minister and the leader in the Progress Party, which may be even more important perhaps to sell papers than the th outbreak of the Third World War, I don't know, what do you think? And it, given that they have this case alone, they will take the whole market here in this case. So you kind of get 100% then. So the idea is whether, and, and there's some assumption here as well about that one paper is, uh, yeah, they kind of hand out an alpha, one minus alpha share of this market. Instead of the 50-50 or 60-40 that we looked on in the actual example. So maybe we kind of parameterize this and put in this alpha. But you will, you will just have to look at it. Okay. Maybe you can get some help from some of the other students here, Yenka, in translating this. Yeah. yeah. We still have five minutes. Let's see how far we get. And again, you should find all Nash equilibria, which paper ends, each newspaper ends up getting most readers. And then, indeed, does it matter for any of the papers if they get information on what newspaper uh, front page uh, case the opponent chooses? So, in question D, the idea is that you should look at the sequential game instead. Okay, the original game is simultaneous; they kind of make decisions without knowing. But then, indeed, I ask, does that does this information kind of make any difference? We looked at an example where it did. Okay, but it doesn't have to be the same case here. And then we do a kind of slight change in E here uh, again. Now, Yenka, maybe I can help you. Maybe I already have translated this. I think so, actually. Uh, I think there's some exercises in the book here. Hopefully they... Let's see if we, if we can identify the same uh, exercises here. I think so. Yeah, we can. Great. You see, the first exercise after the first chapter here is the first same as the first one. The second one here with these newspapers is the same one. Okay, so then we have it. Great. 
Great, let's look back on this one and see what happens in exercise 3. Then there is a Russian roulette. You know what Russian roulette is? You know how it's played? Yeah, you have to have a um, revolver or a pistol, what do you call it? As a barrel? Something is this, this you have these this these type of guns where there is something you put in here with all the bullets in it, but you have also these versions here, okay. You have seen these ones and you put the bullets in here. Of course you put one bullet in and then you flip it and then you put it to your head and you shoot and you leave it to your opponent who does the same thing. Of course he's not allowed to do that. He will continue then. So in the end somebody will be dead, okay? Uh, okay, so this this kind of uh, just a part of it. So the, this formulation is kind of given and you're kind of just asked here to to identify some Nash equilibrium. That was perhaps the last one. Yes. Uh, let's see if we can find this one here. Mm, yeah, it's here. It's number three. Great. So the first three exercises in the textbook will be the exercises we will look at the end column. So no problem. Of course, there is number one four here as well. One five, one six. Yeah, more more exercises. Okay. Then it's time for a break. <laughs>